Hello, everybody. Yo. Oh. Oh. Lots of music today. We'll manage. We have about a couple more seconds before we start. And there we go. And there we go. Hey everybody. Hey. Good morning. Um, I gave this talk once be okay, shut up. Thank you. This is DEF CON, so basically, as serious as I want to be and as it, important as this subject is to me personally, and I really want to um, present it correctly. This is still DEF CON. <laughs> which means, I, I gave this talk two days ago at, yeah, at uh, Black Hat, and I was somewhat serious, but as this is DEF CON, and I also have somewhat less time, I'm going to try and structure the way I swear. So that arbitrary swearing doesn't take away too much time. I'm sorry, just gonna have to be this way. So for DEF CON, I'm going to be the unprofessional person that I am and say a lot of fuck, shit, ass, and swear words in, in um, Russian are preferable. And, but my accent isn't that good for Russian, so I'm gonna try. So, name of the talk. Pretty much spells out what it is. Estonia, information warfare and lessons learned, or the first internet war. Now, <laughs> you guys want to go sit in the back where the cool people sit? No, you seriously look cool to me, and most cool people sitting in the back always. You used that joke earlier. Yes, I know, but it's not a joke. I mean that. And I will repeat every good joke I have because I don't have that many. <laughs> I'm just being honest. So shut the fuck up! Thank you! No! Now, Estonia Information Warfare. Information Warfare, plain and simple, is warfare with information. We're gonna disregard most of it in, well, as far as it is considered today, and just concentrate on the internet, networks, computers, and attacks related to this. Not on psychological warfare, or the press, the media, or anything else that may have anything to do with Iraq or current politics. Lessons learned. That part is actually going to be... That part is actually going to be uh, limited for this talk. But it's what in really interested me. I'm going to have to talk like this because of the next room. So, the first part of this presentation is going to be what, what actually happened in Estonia. But put a little bit of chronology into the situation. Um, who did what, when and where. Of course, from my limited perspective, and I'm going to um, elaborate exactly on that, what that perspective entails. And then go to something that is more interesting to me, but maybe not to you, which is what we can learn from this and some of the strategies we can deduce to use with information warfare from this particular case study. Now, I don't have a lot of time for the second part, so let's hope I get there really quickly. And for the first part, it is technological, but not very. And that is because I figured for this talk and where we aim at getting to, I don't want to show. You, I don't want to show you yet another fucking. There we go. Um, bucket capture of a DDoS attack. Okay. Are you with me with that? Good. So, important note, and I'm going to go through this quickly because again we don't have much time, but it is important. The Estonian CERT, the professionals who worked for Estonian ISPs, the banks, all these organizations, 
they deserve a ton of credit. I had absolutely, well, that's not 100% correct, but almost 100% correct. I have absolutely nothing to do with what happened over there. I was there as a full soldier for almost a week, and I was put in charge of writing the post-mortem for the Estonian attack recommendations for the future, etc. So all credit whatsoever goes to them. But still, I wrote this presentation, and although Hiller's name with the third manager at Estonia is there with me, it's because of respect. He did not see, nor did he review this presentation. So all blame goes to me. All credit goes to them. Who am I? My name is Gadi. Yo! Wake up! It's, I know it's late and the party's are waiting at around 10 o'clock. But okay, shut the fuck up! Number two. Thank you. I'm not gonna be nice to you, you people. Yeah. So, my name is Gadi. Uh, I work for a company called Beyond Security, which is a vulnerability assessment vendor in Israel. And this is basically what we will be talking about. So, <laughs> second time it gets me again. I'm sorry. Sorry, it's very late. So, this thing in Estonia happens, right? And it happens for the first week. And I used to r run the search for the Israeli government. And I, I managed security operations for the Israeli government ISP. And I figured, hey, you know, these things happen. Whenever there is some sort of political te tensions or military tensions after that, always there, is, there are some guys, some group of people, no matter who, who go online and say, those fuckers! And immediately proceed to coordinate a little bit and attack. Shut the fuck up! Number three, there will not be a number four. Do I sound like a teacher or not? With, uh, except for the swear words. So, two weeks pass, right? And I know the Estonian cert manager from, it, from all these global internet security operations going on. And I send him an email saying, Yo, Hilar, um, do you guys need any help? And of course, we worked together before that and all the regular stuff. And he says, when do I pick you up from the airport? So, that was pretty much it. So, at first when I, when I heard about Estonia, I said, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's the small Eastern European third world country or something, right? I don't know where it is. So I immediately thought about the Dilbert cartoon with Elbonia. And <laughs> it's some third world country in Eastern Europe. Their main export is mud. And their main underground export is babies with beards or pictures of. I'm not sure. So you can adopt them and send a lot of money to the Elbonians. And I said, OK, let's go. And apparently I was very, very, very wrong. One, it is a small country in Eastern Europe, not related to Eastern Europe, it's .ee, and it has about 1.3 million people living there. It's the northmost of the, I was, I got some comments on this. <laughs> of the three Baltic states, which pretty much uh, makes it Nordic, I mean they're still Baltic but, and everything, but. I went to Estonia, I got an email from F-Secure, an hour and a half later, on a shuttle, I'm in, I'm in Helsinki drinking beer, a brewer, microbrewery beer, so pretty interesting stuff. Um, it has a flat tax for everything, we, really interesting, and there is no tax on beer. Which it, so, or alcohol in general. And yes, there are a lot of blonde girls over there. I'm sorry, but that was unbelievable. <laughs> but more to the point, after the Soviet Union fell, they started building their infrastructure and they did it to shut up. Seriously, do I need to separate you? You go to the corner. <laughs> so 
after this fall of the Soviet Union, the, no, guys, seriously, seriously, please. I know where you live. I can sit on you. To the motherland, yes. Blet. So, after the fall of the Soviet Union, they started building their infrastructure from scratch, right? They didn't have anything, so they used the most advanced technology they had, which is, of course, the internet. So, they have, for example, 99, around 99, sometimes 98, I don't know, acceptance of online banking or e-banking. Now, for some of us, that may mean, wow, really? All these people check their, their account status online? Or, hmm, seriously, they, up, they transfer a little bit of money? That's cool, but no. Stop people in the streets, and I'm using um, absolute terms here, it's not absolute. And they'll ask them, when have you last been to the bank? And they'll say, last evening, but when have you last been to a real bank? Oh, 10 years ago. It's unbelievable. Complete acceptance. They have ID cards, which for some of you in the States will give the shivers, and they have them with PKI chips, which is really interesting. And because of this, they have actually held two elections, for, one of them from the parliament, from home. Meaning, they actually voted for their government from home using their internet connection, using their ID cards. I'm not sure that would work in the States. <laughs> but uh, it's cool. Down to earth. I mean, they're so internet... Guys, seriously, this is not going to work. I don't have a lot of time. Thank you. So, even elementary school, grammar school, Parents can go to the website every evening, get comments from the teachers, see what classes their children have tomorrow, prepare their bags, etc. It's an online society for real. Really interesting stuff going on over there. So, the attacks start. But before that, no, guys, seriously, die. In Hebrew, it's die, and die means de die is in death in English. So, unless you want me to personally come down there and pull your ears away from your head, I'm being my. Um, the way they describe me online right now. So please, stop. Thank you. So, everybody knew the 9th of May is coming. And on the 9th of May, which is the day the uh, uh, Soviet Russia won over the, German, the Germans, <coughs> there's a lot of uh, political stuff going around. So the Estonian third, the ASO, which is the government's ISP, just imagine that in the States for a second, the government taking away all the work for the ISPs and putting all government sites behind one ISP. That's going to work. So their government ISP, they speak, they talk, and they say, hmm, we can expect some trouble to happen, so let's do something extra. And as you remember earlier, when I first spoke of Estonia, I was a little bit surprised. And as things progressed and I learned about their technology, they're not stupid people. They have a very interesting culture, which is important for this talk. Again, very important. And speaking of this um, ID cards with PKI chips and their online elections, they have a very open environment over there, and this is very important again. A friend of mine heard a talk about their implementation of PKI and their ID cards and all, the, all of that. And the guy goes on stage and lectures, and he speaks about their failures. He does not speak about their challenges, milestones. He does talk about how they implemented it. He talks about their failures. They're a very open society. They are, in fact, a full disclosure society. Meaning, full disclosure comes first. Then we keep things secret if we have to. Let's solve the problem. It's a very different mindset than what you, you would expect. So, they talked a little bit and said, yeah, we can expect some trouble. Let's um, prepare some very strong web server. So put it on some highly defended network, and let's talk some, to some sensitive websites and tell them, you know, prepare a plain text version of your website, just in case. It sounds reasonable to me, you know, they all spoke. I'm always finding find it funny when people say, raise online awareness, you know. We need to raise the, the something from green to red for online people, or we raised our awareness status, or alertness status, something like that. So I figure, yeah, what, what are they going to do with that? I mean, put somebody extra on the night shift so they can play poker? I mean, look at the same screens, never got that. So they got a little bit better at this. And then stuff started. And by stuff, of course, this is DEFCON, so let me put my arbitrary shit. Um, Saturday, 27th of April. Was it Friday? Oops, okay. 27th of April, April the attacks start. Now, this is very interesting. The attacks started at roughly this is funny, roughly exactly the same time 
as the riots in the street of Tallinn happened. Now, we didn't really speak much about what happened in the streets, what the political situation that caused this online aftermath was. And I don't really want to go into the Russian standpoint or the Estonian standpoint because I see it as beside the point for DEF CON. Let's just say, um, on the Estonian side, um, Russia basically conquered Estonia for a long, long time. Then the Germans, the Nazis, came in as saviors. They drove the Russians out. And then Soviet Union came in and kicked their asses, which was pretty cool. So the Estonians have some problems with the Russians. On the other end, um, 20, 30 million um, Soviet soldiers, I'm saying all of them, um, um, died during the Second World War. And justifiably, the ex-Soviet states are very, very sensitive about this. And this goes on and on, and there are both sides to the argument. Whenever I try to pick sides, I always got a little bit to see how complicated the situation is. And coming from Israel, I wasn't really that, uh, I, I didn't really um, pick any sides. And honestly, I had a lot of my mind already. But it was interesting to see the culture. So let's get started real quickly through the timeline. I'm really, really quickly to, through the timeline. Saturday, attacks begin. Now, on the 27th of April, at 2 a.m., people start saying, hey, what's going on here? Let's call Hilar from the CERT. And again, they're really good people. So Hilar was, guys, cut it out last time. I mean it. No, I will not be one of these guys that say last time and then say last time again for three times. I've already been that gay, not, no offense to any gay people. In Israel, we have a different word for that. For four times now. So once again, one more time and you're out, if I have to take you out myself. Thank you. No! I said shut up. This is final. Shut up. Hey. So they call Hiller from the Estonian CERT. He was on his way back from a conference in Dublin and say, um, look, Hiller, we have a problem here. We have a lot of attacks, um, more than we expected. What can we do about this? Um, well, you know, servers are really kind of crumbling. And they decide to move the attacked websites, the currently attacked websites, to um, the secure web server that they put up. And that was that. Call ended. The next day, there is another phone update at 6 a.m. Hiller already landed. And there are new targets now under attack. And there is a new, the new well defended server is under severe stress. This is the point to mention that this defended server was actually behind a, an OpenBSD firewall. And that that one machine is the only machine that survived unscathed throughout the whole incident. If you have any OpenBSD fans in the crowd. <laughs> one. <laughs> now, on Saturday at 6 p.m., there was a staff meeting. People actually got together at the AS ASO, the IS government ISP office, and they started discussing all the different uh, types of attacks happening. Again, nothing too special. We've seen it all before, but still, it's really big. They, they said, hold on, stop. What's going on here? We need to reassess the situation. And the interesting thing is, because this was so, so big, they weren't able to collect correct metrics on this. So, the attack actually resulted in 100 to 1,000 times, this is a guess, the normal amount of traffic. Um, they proceeded with basic incident response, much like anyone would do, and that was that. So they are still not sleeping. They have another staff meeting. Their attacks are happening a lot more often, more successful. They have a realization coming that this is not regular. They came to the words cyber riot. I don't like the words, I don't like cyber something, anything. Um, but there were riots in the street. And they have seen all these things that we are going to talk about in a second happening on the Russian websites, blogosphere, blogs, forums, whatever. That all these people, the population itself, really didn't like what was going on in Estonia and were fired up, up, fired up about it. So they called it cyber riot and we'll discuss that a little bit more in, in a couple minutes. Now, all these Russian-speaking or Russian-language websites, forums, for blogs, started really discussing what was going on. But it was really quickly. It happened like that. And suddenly, we've seen memes, we've seen epidemics spread through societies, blogs. Within hours, 
certain, amount, certain information is everywhere, a link, whatever else. This was more, this was much faster. We can say for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this was not something, um, that this was something um, which was organized or anything else. But somebody took the time to go to all these blogs, go to all these forums, tell them, look guys, this is what's going on. Let's do something about it. And usually when these attacks happen, and again, all the difference between cyber riot or terrorism or whatever else you want to call it online, is usually defacements or DDoS. This was not just one group who attacked. It was a whole lot of people who got pissed. And the one phrase that kept repeating itself was, fucking Estonian fascists, or Nazis, or whatever else you want to choose, with any Russian would like to explain to you why they're welcome to do so. Now, these guys, the Estonians in the meeting, quickly reached the decision that, um, well, being in emergency mode, or in red mode, or in black mode, if any of you know the color theory for shooting, is not scalable. They have had a couple of days, three days of confusion, and they got through it. Now it's time to make this routine. It's time to make the incident response more maintainable. So they decided tomorrow the weekend ends. It was really luck that it all happened during the weekend. We need to get, start getting our act together. They sent people home, and the next morning they came there at 6 a.m. This is what they found, basically. Um, this is from an Estonian newspaper. And you can see the geek on, or not geek, or somebody who read the blogs on the left. Yes, I'm actually interpreting the picture. Uh, with his aunt or mother or grandma behind him, really not understanding his online game, firing his Kalachnikov, I mean, sorry, AK-47 for you Americans. And, um, well, that's the wall behind him, basically, through the screen, as you can see. And it's all... <laughs> so... <laughs> The guys in Estonia really liked this picture as a representation of what happened over there. And I think it's pretty neat. If you want the actual, I, I, this is not going to be in the presentation because I don't currently right now have the URL to attribute it to. So I just put it here for now. The blogosphere. If you look for this, um, this is actually Latin rather than Russian. But if you look for this online, you'll find a ton of websites talking to people and telling them basically, guys, you are sci-fi fans on a sci-fi forum. Sorry, SF, for any of you fanatics. And I'm a sci-fi fanatic, by the way. Um, any of you are free to right now go and fight this. Look at what the Estonians did to the monument and all the graves under that. Let's forget the politics and why it happened aside for a second. And here is how you do it. You open a command, uh, uh, command uh, run whatever window, you enter CMD, you click enter, and you do ping, and then you click enter, and then you write ping, and then you click enter, and then you write ping, and then you click enter. Now, this sounds very silly to some of us here, but hey, did that get, you know, that simple action of being able to do something got people fired out. Anybody here can read Russian? Dimitri, you around maybe? No Dimitri around? Okay, who can read Russian here? You, you raise your hand. Can you no, try? And no. Can you try and read that for us, please, for a second? Translate it if you can, please. <laughs> well, um, I think it's essentially saying that uh, due to any site in Estonia, I think it should be attacked. And I mean, I'm not going to give a literal translation. Can you try, please, if you can? No? Okay. So, basically, this tells people about what happened, and if they want to take some action, they can. And it explains to them how to, happen, how to open the console window and click enter after all the ping commands. And it's pretty straightforward, as you can see. But still, this is not very complicated. It gets people fired up, no more than that. So, let's try and automate it a little bit. This is just a simple um, batch script batch file that lets people do this automatically. Most of the targets were government. This was political to a level, of course. Um, but there are other tools as well. DDoS tools, whatever you want, it could be downloaded. 
And as people got fired, fired up on this and got excited about this, other people started taking note. So before everybody starts jumping out and asking, hey, 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 who is behind this? Who did this? Did the Russians do it? I can right now say, for the blogosphere um, perspective only, that um, either this was a really, the first self-learning, self-adjusting attack I have personally ever seen, or to a level this was planned, or more to the point, organized. Now, there were actually, much like the instructions that came on the Russian language blogosphere, periodic updates telling people, hey, you know, these are the DNS server, this is the tool you need to use tomorrow, and um, yeah, use this uh, script instead, etc. This responded directly to what the defenders in Estonia were doing. Now, who did this? That's a question we'll have to try and answer later. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing these guys. But um, so another thing that of interest that happened was ad hoc intelligence. Many Esto Estonians who spoke Russian went on these blogs and forums, etc., started reading what was going on, and in ad hoc fashion, through their social networks, their social wealth, they started passing this information around, and it all drained to, directly to the Estonian cert somehow. This was not organized. So the Estonian cert could actually pick up the phone and say, you know what? Tomorrow is DNS day. Prepare your servers. Which was pretty nice. Here you see another tool. This is taken from, this is taken from the F-Secure blog, actually, or web blog, um, about a specific DDoS attacker for Estonia. And let's just look a little, a little bit at the numbers. Somebody told me I have a miscalculation here somewhere. I'm not sure where it is. Um, so at the ASO, which is only the government's ISP over there, and only for the first day or two, they have a 10 megabit uh, line, and they add a four megabit, a mega packets per second attack. Now, packet can mean anything from a few bytes to a few kilobytes, so or more. So this is not exact numbers, of course, and again, metri metrics were a problem. So from a four megapackets per second attack of ICMP Echo, there are different attacks here. Um, the attack became 1.2 megapackets per second, which is interesting. That was just an initial filtering. Then Cisco Guard was actually sitting around there waiting for a demo. So they pulled it up, got all the dust out of it, <laughs> connected it, and it got down from 1.2 megapackets per second to 150 kilopackets per second, which was pretty neat. They configured Cisco Guard a little bit further, and they got down to three kilopackets per second. Now, looking at the traffic itself, it was around, again, none of these numbers are complete. This is a work in progress. You can see three megapackets per second of ICMP echo, echo um, and general attack, attack traffic. One megapackets per second of scene traffic fluid, etc. We're not really clear on that. 150 kilopackets per second of other attack traffic. And, and this is not final, of course, only three kilopackets per second, fuck off, of uh, <laughs> legitimate traffic. So, this is pretty neat, in my opinion. Now, we can compare these attacks, in many cases, to other attacks we've seen. And honestly, this is nothing. Why, do, why are we even talking about this? You know, we have seen the root server, DNS root servers under attack. We've seen many large RSPs under attack. And I don't know, I mean, this four megapackets per second is big, it's significant, but it's not that. So one, it was pretty sizable. Again, four megapackets per second is not bad. And it was just right for Estonia. The resources were used correctly. This is very important. But to be honest, even if this wasn't, even if this was completely insignificant traffic-wise, what we can judge it by is actually the significance of its impact. If one guy walked by with a stone and threw it at the computer, it would cause this impact. As far as I'm concerned, it's exactly the same. I don't care. Now, the scale of all the different attacks that were actually happening as this was going on, this was not just ping commands. We are going to see a little bit more right now. That was really impressive. That I have not seen in a while, and not on that scale ever. Ever is a strong word, but... Um. So there are a few attacks of interest. There was, for example, a spam attack, or an email attack, against the Estonian parliament, and 
this, I believe, again, not exact times, resulted in about two days of downtime. Now, this was during the weekend, it, I think. Sorry, I can't verify that right now. But two days of downtime for the Estonian parliament email systems in a country that's internet-based on that far level. That's critical. There were a few other attacks, such for example, two routers crashed. There were many other routers out there, routers or whatever you want to call them, that suffered some crashes and stuff like that. But the main attacks that actually happened were one router was actually misconfigured. It allowed connections to go directly to it. So that router, router was taken out. <laughs> the second one was um, the router just couldn't handle the traffic. Seriously, 100 times, 1,000 times more, how much do you leave behind over your current needs of maximum use? Not 1,000 times over, right? Not even 10 times over in most cases. Now we could look at this graph, for example, and this is from MRTG, <laughs> created by Pearl. And um, you can see two spikes on the left side. Now, we have seen this with other botnet attacks. This is not special to Estonia. But we believe these are measurement attacks. We can't be sure. But um, basically, what happens sometimes is that you see some sort of concentrated attack that goes on for two minutes, five minutes, or something like that. And then at some point, it disappears. Well, not some point, two minutes after that. <laughs> it disappears. Between an hour after that to three weeks after that, a huge attack follows. This time it wasn't that long, but um, that's pretty interesting, in my opinion, to see a little bit of organization of botnets. Where did these botnets come from, by the way? Let's try and answer that. But um, to be honest, the botnet attacks were quite regular. Now, there are so many different forms and attacks happening, but there were no bots or nearly no bots, can never say never, measuring what's kind of problematic, attacking from within Estonia, or if it's your organization, from within your organization. We can know that there are bots everywhere. Why did the botnets exclude the bots from within Estonia in this attack? That's not directly clear. Um, but it's very interesting, and I would like to discuss it a little bit later on, because this did happen. This graph is pretty interesting. There was a comment, this I believe also was on the FCQ blog, but I can't find it, and I'm sure I saw it somewhere else as well. A comment was made by someone on one of these forums saying, you know, I created a PayPal account. I created a fund to hire a botnet to attack Estonia. Please donate money. Which is pretty cool, right? On the same thread, somebody else said, hey, buddy, I'll donate two of my botnets, right? This is the important thing. This is about the firing up the population. Yes, some of the population cannot do much, but a lot of these people are capable. Some of these people actually know security or have botnets ready for spam or whatever else you want to do, especially when it comes to Russia. And again, this is my usual disclaimer when I say this. I honestly have nothing against Russia or Russians. A fifth of Israel is Russian. My ex-girlfriend is Russian. But yes, it was Russians who attacked. <laughs> so, and Russia has a lot of cybercrime going on. No, no kidding. Ooh. So in this graph above, you can actually see one of the attacks disappearing at some point exactly at 3 a.m. Estonian time, which is midnight GMT. This is why I believe this particular attack was indeed a hired botnet attack. Now there are some special botnets around. We've seen this before as well, but this, was, this is not often used unless you have a real, a real nasty target you just want to take out. And these happen every few months usually. Somebody builds specific botnets using samples from new code base, which antiviruses and nobody else has basically seen before, these do not propagate, they do not try to infect and others and get bigger, and these honestly are just there. They do not connect to a command and control server, right? They do not try and get orders. It's hard coded inside. So what we believe happens usually, and we have seen this actually in, in action, is that a current botnet 
with the current pool of victims gets this sample dropped on these machines. If you look at these machines, you're likely, unless something of course happened there that's not regular, to find that botnet sample there. Probably a few others as well, you know, but that's basically, you can co correlate that. So this was a special attack that raised our eyebrows a little bit. Um, incident response. Let's talk a little bit about what the, the Estonians actually did to, to, to combat all this. I mean, geez. So, basic stuff. You know, what are the sources of the attacks? Or the attackers, for that matter. Who is attacking us? Where are they from? And then, what are the targets currently under attack? We want to take care of that. We want to secure these servers. Now, if we are actually dealing with botnets, can we find the command and control servers, the CNC server, or the C2 server if you're from the military, and take it out, or do something else to it? Which, you guys are scaring me. Okay. So, um... Thank you. Thank you. Woo! So... Let's move on. If you can see the command and control server, this is one issue about Estonia, if you think about it. If you can detect the bot on, your, on the network or know where it comes from, you can try and sniff it out. Or just, this Estonia is a very small country, as we discussed. Everybody knows everybody. They can raise the phone and say, hey, buddy, you have this bot on your network, or more likely step outside into the street, walk two meters, and go into the second building. And you find the botnet, and you look at it, and you see, hey, this is the command and control server it connects to. So this is very interesting that whether it was OPSEC, do not use bots inside of Estonia, whether it was a fluke, hey, things happen, you know, although I don't believe in this, or whether this was an actual attack plan, no bots are found in Estonia. The internet is international infrastructure. It's not national infrastructure. It's your computer, your computer, my computer, and a computer of somebody in Korea and somebody in Nigeria. And all of these computers impact everybody's security. So to respond to the Estonia incident, you had to do quite a bit. Now, the main goal of the first responders, of course, was one. Bring the systems back online, if not keep them online, right? Try identifying, I mean, you can not anymore respond by identifying attacks. You start by identifying their impact. Meaning, hey, the light is off over there, what happened? Don't identify the packet going there, you can't do that anymore. It's gone. This, was, this is very big. For, for me anyway. Now, on the 28th, there were two decisions made on mitigation approaches. Now again, don't concentrate on the sources, but rather on the targets first, which means also the impact, what happens. Then they said, you know, we can't really do technical analysis anymore. Do it only when it has direct and a clear effect on mitigation. We're in mitigation mode. Now, again, Estonia is a, in a very unique situation. Everyone knows everyone, or more to it, more to the point, everyone can get in a car and drag people out of bed. And when you drink, you have to get out of bed, and it's very painful, and it's a culture issue. Um, I, I went to Estonia, I left quite a few days later, and don't remember anything that happened there, so. <laughs> kind of like Dexcon, you know? So, being small, they are very concentrated online. They could actually do things like blocking incoming connections to their banks or other websites at some point. This is not usually the best response. At one network I was at, I actually blocked, you can never know everything, but I actually blocked Germany off. This is not useful in any way. This is not really a long-term solution, but I blocked the networks that were disturbing me and then worked behind the scenes to get the network back. We, those of us who work on networks can pretty much see this. Um, and they don't necessarily have to block. They can decide, for example, that only within the internet exchange of Estonia can connections be made to the banks, for example. Not everything has to be a negative technology. <clears throat> now, Estonia's luck is really the cert. There are a lot of people there that did a lot of work. The professionals, the DISPs, the banks. But honestly, the cert took these people and made this into a response. Estonia, as advanced as Estonia is, and we discussed that, they are not ready. They were not ready, I'm sorry for this attack. Yes, there have been attacks before, they were pretty, but still, they were pretty much virgins in online attacks. 
They have not seen this scale. I mean, nobody has seen this scale before. I mean, sorry, we have seen attacks, we have seen large attacks, but an entire country with such an impact, and we'll discuss the impact in a second, has not quite been seen before. Thank you. Bye bye. Long live the motherland. Blat. So. So, the cert basically is there to respond to incidents, right? Now I can actually smile. <laughs> the cert is there to respond to incidents, and as such, of course, it manages incident response, it does a lot, it coordinates people, and in a small country they can actually, again, raise the phone or go over to people and get things done. That's pretty cool. But this particular case was better. Hilar is a great guy, and he can kick your ass. Sorry, this is DEFCON, I'll say a lot of ass. You can kick your ass if you want to do what you need to. Hey, buddy, where are you? Do you want me to buy you another beer? But if it doesn't work, okay, I'll kick your ass. So basically, the cert there is really cool people, and there are only two people, really, really, really. And they've done an amazing job. The luck of this was the first attacks were against the government, where it was also concentrated. And most of these websites were hosted at ASO, which is an uplink to Elion, which is the main Estonian um, ISP. So most of the incident response was done by the CERT, ASO, the government's ISP, and Elion. Then the attack spread. But most of the other servers under attack were also at Elion. So the, everybody got together, and the CERT ran some Jabber server or ch IRC server, I don't remember exactly what, to get uh, all the chat going. And it basically, by consensus, and by fact of being there, got to be the leader. They, yeah, they, yes, they are the body that's supposed to respond to this, but they are somewhat civilians, and they just made it happen. So what saved Estonia is the incident response. We cannot always, I mean, we have to admit to ourselves in, as an industry, yes, we want bad things not to happen, yes, we want to try and prevent them, but whether mal by malice or by mistake, and there is a very important quote on that that I won't make right now because I can never remember it, see, shit will hit the fan. Things will happen, and we will all, and we are all judged by how we respond to it. For them, oh my God, I want them working anywhere that bad shit happens any day. Seriously. So, global incident response. Again, it's the internet, and they are busy. They're just two people and the other professionals in Estonia. What are they going to do? So they escalated, much like you call an ISP, second level escalation. They saw the sources of attack. They asked four certs from, from Europe, hey guys, can you help us out? So these certs sent out abuse reports, raised the phone and called people from Germany, Finland, and Slovenia. And they got in touch with the Internet Security Operations Community. Yes, Hilar was directly in touch as well, but these people really helped. It is a global village. Sorry for the term. So incident response on a global scale was critical. We can't ignore the fact the Internet is global. Well, we can try and say that internet government governance works and that .xxx and .net get a lot of money, but that's not really what disturbs me these days. So let's discuss Estonia's, what I call, predicament of e-success. And this is pretty much known. The more technological a country is, the more reliant on technology it becomes, and therefore it's more vulnerable, right? More technology, more vulnerabilities. And it's the same about basically usage, usage and reliability on the internet. So most of the banking clients in Estonia haven't been into a real bank in how long? 10 years? Not all of them, but most of them. And during the downtime, a couple of large banks had downtime over there, and people could not buy groceries. They couldn't buy what Hiller calls milk, bread, and gas. Everything goes online. If the online transactions are no longer, you know, if the internet is down, this is down. Um, now, of course, there are all the non-client transactions. This is really big. We need to actually make the move and understand that progress is good, but what of resilience and fallback? Consider e-banking or online banking. It's a great progress. I'm all for progress. And I'm talking about fraud right now. But if there were four branches before and there is one now because all these expensive clients now use the web channel, which is cheap, and that's great. 
what about fallback if, we, if something happens? Now, I'm not saying that banks, for example, should be regulated further for stuff that's not credit or client or money related. But consider, this is critical infrastructure, and we'll discuss that in a second, and I'm not sure whether they like regulation or not, forget regulation, if the bank is under such an attack, where will they go to help, for help? They can do their own incident response, but it's, this is beyond that. Estonia is really a window into where we might be. We are all reliant on the internet in some level. I'm not sure Israel is reliant enough to die if somebody attacks us on the internet. No. And about the US, I really have no idea. Maybe there will be some depression, maybe some recession, maybe more. Estonia is all the way out there to where we are heading. This is a window to the future, and we have an opportunity by it. I hate the term window of opportunity. Let's use it as a sto a storytelling for the evening, you know, at night. We need to think about this when we make progress happen. Let's pro progress because we don't have a lot of time. Critical infrastructure actually proved to be the private and business sector. Not the transportation and energy systems, not SCADA systems. Yes, this is critical infrastructure, the military infrastructure, the civil infrastructure, energy transportation. But it's not what was attacked. It's not what will be immediately attacked. It's always first that, then the business sector or whatever, and then everything else. But seriously, we need to put this first. At least consider it in more serious terms. We can't tell the private sector what to do in most cases, and we really don't want to. At least I don't want to. But my opinion is this is critical infrastructure, and it proved to be critical infrastructure in Estonia. You know what? It was ISPs, which is pretty obvious, the banks, which may not be as obvious, and media websites, the press. Let's not talk about uh, manipulation or hacking. Just the idea of all the media websites, or most of them being down, silence on the radio. Very bad for anybody who ever worked on a radio station. Now, another critical infrastructure which presented itself is actually you and me. Every single one of us. What we can't even handle in cybercrime in everyday life with, with every user and their grandma having viruses and malware and everything else on their computer. Not good. So, these users have become critical infrastructure. Consider attacking from outside of Estonia and inside of Estonia. This is pretty amazing. We all, some of us know about the, the, the critical infra, the regular infrastructure. Some of us know about the civil, sorry, the private or the business infrastructure. This, just some of us maybe consider sometimes, but we don't know how to handle on that high of front. Information warfare is usually on a very high degree of, this is national security strategy, this is general war strategy. Information warfare can be used as fighting, it does not need to be war, as part of the old fighting procedure, or war procedure. Then we have some spots going around, but all the way down we drop, with some theory and some actual action, all the way down to packets. This computer attacks that computer. We may have some planning, we may have some logistics backing that up, but this is missing. Estonia is amazing because it provides us with actual case studies. And let's go through them if we have time. Who was behind the attacks? Don't everybody want to know? The KGB. Okay, not. But um, it sounds good. Um, so first of all, ad hoc, loose coupling of people coming together and doing some stuff to get things going, or was this a planned assault? I don't believe it was Russia. Well, that's my opinion. There was organization, there was planning, but hey. So blogosphere meme, epidemic. The internet is perfect for plausible deniability. Consider, there were botnet attacks from compromised machines, spoofed attacks. What are you gonna do? So information warfare, you may know who your opponent, your rivals are. You may know your enemies, but you most likely from technological sources alone will not know who your attacker is. So there are quite a few indications, there are four. Actually, these are the four, honestly that this incident was organized and planned again to a level. It started virtually at the same time as the incident in Tallinn streets. The Russian blogosphere basically was updated periodically responding to the defenders. Virtually no bots attacked from within Estonia, although that changed later on. So OPSEC fuck up when they attacked later on, or was this planned? I don't know. 
and at least one botnet attack was from specially crafted botnet, bot sources. Interesting. Now, the Russians are coming, not. Um, this could be a coincidence, each of these alone, but honestly, every single one of these ind indications alone shows of some organization. Again, I don't know on what level. So ad hoc, fully planned assault, I don't know, I won't know. Was it the Russians? In fact, yes, it was the Russians. Was it Russia? Opinion, absolutely not. And you can read the tone of how the Russian politicians spoke and the Estonian politicians said a few things, which you can see the tone is pretty much, yeah, that's cool, but no, we, don't want, we, we are not doing that. But um, I can tell you more than that. So I tried to come up with a term for discussing uh, what this is. You know, buttons have been out there for a while, but how do you describe a soldier who may be working for you and for your enemy? A traitor? Friendly fire? I don't know. So I came to this um, thing called biological warfare example here, which is let's trade prisoners and let's infect them with biological warfare, germs, whatever. So I came across this fifth column concept, which different Wikipedias in different languages, Hebrew and English, actually define differently. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But um, it's attributed originally to um, Leo um, Trotsky, or Lev Trotsky, who spoke about this and used this, but uh, it's really attributed in history to um, a general with, in the Spanish uh, Civil War who was asked, okay, so how big is your army? He said, I have four columns, but my fifth column is inside Madrid. So whether this was some sort of um, covert action inside of Madrid, or the people of Madrid themselves, I don't want to go into politics. Some people have been calling this, about, talking about this about Iraq and Vietnam. Unrelated to politics, people have been abusing this term. These people can actually be shooting at you and shooting at the enemy at the same time. They're owned. Owned computers. So it's an unwitting zombie fifth column. That's the best I can come with. So we have botnets. And another interesting example is from Japan. We have Winnie. Winnie is basically a P2P application in, in, in Japanese. And I don't want to say every, but every computer in Japan has it on. There are vulnerabilities in it. The author was arrested, he was released. I'm not sure he will ever, ever want to patch that. But it's pretty scary that one application, which has been used before to steal information from computers that, it had, that had sensitive information on them, and Winnie, that scares me. One application, vulnerable application, nobody to update it on every computer. Not every, but yeah. So M Martin Van Krevold came up and said, you know, today, pretty much straightforward, but it won't be always countries we fight, it might be organizations. I'm saying, you know what, I'm not mourning, but this is populations we are fighting. Now, the attacker strategy, and we'll go through this really, really quickly because we don't have time. So cyber terrorism whether, versus internet riot or cyber riot, it's mob control. Consider if you're one person or maybe 20 people in a mob, going a little bit to the right, it will follow you. If you say, down with that statue, that statue will go down. What about the internet with blogs, with comments, all that stuff going, sorry, DEFCON shit going around? It's really interesting. So online mob, online control, this is taking psychological warfare or intelligence warfare and put it on the offensive. It's pretty damn cool. It will get attention in the future. This is new. So attackers from the world and within Estonia respectively. Pretty interesting. Attacking the business and private infrastructure as we mentioned and the routing infrastructure, which amazingly comes last. So, the defense's goal was simple, maintain regular service and stability of the country's internet. That's cool. But, you know, Clausewitz on defense, he basically said something of sort of, defense is more powerful than attack. Because the more the, the engagement goes on, the stronger the, the defense becomes and more organized, and the more logistical soldiers and organizations and stuff like that, the, the people need to live behind. I'm not really interpreting Clausewitz for any of you now, so all you Clausewitzians or whatever you call themselves, please don't kill me. But this is not necessarily true for online. Yes, I, I tried to come up with the, an answer to the question of is information warfare the same as warfare? And in many cases, there are things we can study and learn. But in other, ca and we can look at information warfare as fighting. Yes, it can support, it can be a tool with regular warfare. But it's not analogous to warfare in the way that aerial warfare is analogous to a way 
to marine warfare, and there are differences. It's a completely different, in my opinion right now, it may change, form of warfare. And Clausewitz is, in my opinion right now, wrong. Although, whatever is the main thing that runs this warfare thingy online, the niches can really become the main thing. Everything changes all the time. So, defender strategy, you already heard some of it. It must be told in a story, and I'll try to do it in one minute. So, crowd control. Consider, in the streets of Tallinn, they actually closed the, the people in. They said, you know what, guys? Um, here are the people, let's close them in, let's try and contain the incident. This is incident response, which is basic. Not what we invented in computer security. Respond to the incident, contain it, better forces will come on later. We don't have to discuss that. But culture specific, these were Russians. Russians are great people, but they love the liquor. It was a liquor area, they all went home at 5 a.m. <laughs> um, in Paris, I don't know if this is true, but some of the uh, strategies are, for example, okay, 30 seconds. Some of this, okay, let's move through this real quickly. There is the broken windows theory, which I really wanted to talk to you about and compare to bathrooms. Uh, intelligence, deception, border control, cultural importance, and which is from the Bible, which means in cunning and tricks you will wage war. And I don't have time to talk about all this strategy and the political implications, I'm sorry. Political awareness, why this is the first internet war? Because the politicians knew about it, talked about it, and it's their war. This on the left is Hilar, that's Ivor on the right. I am Gadi, and thank you very much. We don't have time for questions.